Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's web seminar. I'm Karen Weisskopf, the Director of Marketing at First Island Investors, and I am joined today by Robert D. Rosenthal, our Chairman, CEO, and Chief Investment Officer, as well as Philip Malakoff and Edward Pileski, who are each Senior Vice President. We hope that 2018 is off to a great start for everyone. Later this year, we will mark our 35th anniversary, and we want to take this opportunity to thank our clients for their trust all these years. We look forward to maintaining that trust and continuing to serve you and your families for many more. Before we begin, I will cover a few logistical items. All participants are currently in listen-only mode. After the team delivers the presentation, we will have time to answer any questions submitted throughout the presentation, as well as some which we received in advance. In addition to our presenters, we have additional members of the investment committee here for that segment. Please feel free to submit questions as we go by using the dialog box labeled questions. At this point, everyone should see a screen that says today's speakers. If you don't, please type something into the chat area and we'll do our best to help troubleshoot. And finally, our general counsel has asked that I remind you, today's session may discuss the performance of some strategies and past performance is not a guarantee of future <coughs> I now hand it over to Bob. Thank you, Karen, and good afternoon, and Happy New Year to all of you. And thanks for joining our first webinar of the year. If you turn to page three, you'll see the quote that I typically use at the beginning of a quarterly letter or a thought piece. In this case, it says, uncertainty will always be part of the taking charge process. Even with a good long-term asset allocation plan, There'll be periods of uncertainty, and certainly the last several days have reminded us of that. So I'd like to read an email that we put out to all clients, centers of influence yesterday, talking about the stock market correction. So if you haven't had a chance to see that email, I'll read it now. The market downturn and volatility of the last three trading days reflects an adjustment in prices, which is typical of stock market investing and last occurred in the first quarter of 2016, known as a correction where the equity market declines by at least 10% from its peak. At this point, our defensive and traditional equity strategies are approximately even for 2018 on balance. This will vary depending on one's asset allocation. In our opinion, this recent correction is detached from the fundamentals that we see of a growing global economy, low interest rates, low inflation, and growing corporate earnings. Where we have stated for some time now that valuations were not cheap, they have now become more attractive based on the fundamentals we previously mentioned. In addition, we believe the recent enactment of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 will prove to be a long-term positive for American business, leading to even greater economic growth and corporate profitability. Volatility, as experienced these last three trading days, is never fun, was almost non-existent last year. But after 15 consecutive months of stock market gains, it was a given that at some point this year, we would face a downturn. We believe this is constructive and remain cautiously optimistic that this year will reward long-term investors with a prudent asset allocation. So that was the email that we sent out in our effort to always communicate and be transparent uh, with our clients and, and their other advisors. Um, if you turn to page four, we'll cover the agenda. A 2017 recap, why we did as well as we did. Investor concerns for 2018, economic positives for 2018, the impact of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act from an investor standpoint. Uh, Steve Jukum, our CFO, put out a piece at the end of last year on the tax impact. Hopefully you all have read it. If you want another copy, please contact Steve. And then our approach to 2018, and then as Karen said, we'll have a Q&A period and hopefully be able to answer all of your questions. If you turn to page five, you'll see that 2017 was an excellent year. And we chose this graph 
to demonstrate that as well as we did last year, and we did quite well, with, all, with the three averages achieving records on a repeated basis, that over the last 10 years, there have been periods of downturn, such as 2008, 2009, and the first quarter of 2016 when we suffered our last major correction. The point of this slide is to demonstrate that those who are committed to long-term investing will do well with a prudent asset allocation. So our clients have achieved significant returns over the course of these 10 years, notwithstanding the fact that there were significant periods of uncertainty when earnings and some of the other factors we'll mention carried the day. You turn to page six, uh, contributors to a strong year, who controls the government? Now this chart was in our thought piece a full year ago. And we did it because it showed that under certain configurations of political oversight in Washington, the equity markets fare better under some circumstances than others. And as you can see, last year we presented that with a Republican president, a Republican House, and a Republican Senate, the average market return over long periods of time was 18.6%. And that actually was better than any other configuration of government in Washington. We actually performed, or the S&P performed, at 21.8%, so we slightly exceeded that significant return. In our opinion, the deregulation and pro-growth initiatives that come out of a Congress that's Republican and a president that's a Republican seem to do somewhat better than other political configurations. But this chart is histor it's historical, it's not a guarantee, but it certainly worked last year, and the fact that we had it in our thought piece a year ago um, proved to make us look smart, at least for one year. If you turn to page seven, you'll see also contributors to a strong year our optimism of business and consumers, and this is very important. The NFIB index of small business optimism, as you can see, 2016, 17, uh, the end of 16, and throughout 17, uh, became very positive. And we believe the drivers of optimism for business and also the lower chart, which is the University of Michigan consumer sentiment, also was very constructive and positive. And the drivers of this optimism are deregulation in many areas. Um, this administration from day one started to peel back some of the regulations that were brought on during previous administrations. The Tax Cut and Jobs Act which is a reduction of the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%, was construed as very positive by business. We believe that to be the case. It levels the playing field for American business as opposed to many other industrialized countries. Also driving this optimism, particularly for the consumer, is low unemployment and low inflation. So we have a backdrop where business is optimistic and is investing. They're being encouraged to invest through fiscal growth initiatives, and the consumer is feeling the benefits of all of that, plus low unemployment and low inflation. So there's great confidence in both business and with consumers, and that was reflected in the stock market last year as well. If you turn to page eight, contributors to a strong year also included more robust US GDP growth and synchronized global growth, very important to the outcome of the companies that we invest in. If you look at real gross domestic product, the chart on the left, there was a pickup in the fourth quarter and there's improving GDP growth in the United States. Whereas for the prior eight years of the previous administration, GDP growth in the US averaged about 1.8, 1.9% approximately. Given the initiatives that were mentioned before, in the, in the fourth quarter, we were up 2.5%, and we're continuing to increase that with some thoughts that this year will be closer to 3%. So the U.S. economy is picking up based on the consumer optimism, based on business optimism, and based on some legislation that's come out of Washington, which is pro-growth. So we're no longer just depending on low interest rates. The chart to the right, is equally as important. And here we show that in the US, the Eurozone, Japan, China, 
and then in total for the world, that there's an uptick in global growth. In years past, Euro, the Eurozone and Japan had not been contributing to global growth as they recovered, or in particular Europe recovered, from the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Now they, along with the United States and China, especially with an accelerating growth in the United States, are contributing to more robust global growth. That will contribute to the earnings, we believe, of the many companies that we invest in. So you've got better growth in the U.S., and you've got better growth coming from around the world, and that has to be good for business. The next slide, also a contributor to a strong year, and this is something that we talk about on a constant basis, and that's earnings growth for the S&P 500, which represent the 500 largest companies in the exchange uh, in the United States. Now, it's an interesting chart because if you take a look at to the right and you see 2017, projected 2018, 19, and 20, you see that corporate earnings are taking off. A matter of fact, I just read from FactSet that in the fourth quarter of uh, 2017, thus far, earnings that have been reported by about 60% of the companies in the S&P 500, earnings were up by 13.5%. That's a great number. Now, that's in contrast to, if you look at this chart, 2014, 2015, 2016, we had flat earnings per share. If you look at the period 2008-2009, when we had the horrific, uh, what we call decession, somewhere between a recession and a depression, earnings went down. So you've got a period to the left where earnings went down, then you had a period 14, 15, and 16 where earnings were flat, and now we have earnings taking off, which reflects the global growth that I mentioned before, and it also reflects going forward the most recent tax legislation that lowered taxes on many corporations in the US. So this is a very positive chart. And again, what's supporting the growth that we had last year from our portfolios? Earnings growth. What's supporting it, we believe this year, it'll be continued earnings growth. If, you, if we turn to the next slide, this is a very important factor. Strong corporate revenues. And again, it's similar to the last chart in that it shows from 2017, 18, and projected 19 and 20, you're projecting greater revenue growth for the S&P 500. If you look at 2013, 14, 15, and 16, there was flat revenue growth. So the global growth that we're talking about, the cuts to the consumer in their tax rates and other benefits of low inflation is being reflected in more demand, both from the consumer and from business. This is particularly important to us because this is not just profit margins going up for businesses by laying off people and, and productivity enhancements. It's true demand that's driving revenue growth. So when you've got strong revenue growth coupled with strong earnings per share growth, it leads to happiness in our portfolios. And again, we have, as you know, concentrated portfolios where we try and pick the best of the companies that are out there that have the best opportunity to grow their revenues and grow their sales. And we think that's particularly important going forward. I will now turn it over to my partner, Phil. My partner's Phil and Ed, and I'll be back a bit later to summarize. Thanks, Bob. So uh, this is Phil Malikoff. And Bob just recapped what was a strong 2017 for the equity markets and the economy. But as we transition into 2018, as Bob said, we do remain cautiously optimistic, but we do have some underlying concerns. Things such as increasing volatility, Federal Reserve actions, inflationary pressure, stock market valuations, and geopolitics. 2017, we experienced historically low volatility, as you can see on slide 12. And we believe that will, it will increase this year. Last year, there were only 10 days with an S&P 500 range of more than 1%. The average over the last 25 years has been about 125 such days. And before last year, the low in that period was 40 days. The so last year experienced extraordinarily low volatility. 
Already this year, there have been six such days, including the last four days. Increases in volatility tend to occur when there are dislocations or shakeouts in the market. It can be caused by economic reports, such as the hourly wage growth report that was released last Friday, and I'll discuss later in the webinar, geopolitical events, or merely changes in investor sentiment. We expect the investment markets will have periods of heightened volatility throughout 2018. And while many newer investors have only experienced increasing volatility with equity market sell-offs, those of us who are investing in the late 90s remember when volatility was high as equity markets were soaring. So it can work both ways. Another concern this year involves the Federal Reserve and how its actions will be viewed by investors. On this slide, you can see the gap between the gray and red lines on the right. The gray line represents market expectations for the Fed to set its Fed fund rates over the next few years, moving from the current level of 1.38% to 1.99% by year end and 2.22% at the end of 2019. The red line shows the Fed's expectations of these rates. 2.13% by year end and 2.69% at the end of next year. Obviously, there's a disconnect between the two, with the Fed indicating higher rates than the market is pricing in. Should the Fed's actions continue on its expected path and deviate from market expectations, meaning it would tighten more aggressively than expected, we would expect more volatility in the credit and equity markets. The Fed, which began tapering or reducing its $4.4 trillion balance sheet in October of last year has been doing so at a modest pace. Over time, it is expected to increase the monthly amounts of bonds that it is removing from its asset base with the goal of significantly reducing its balance sheet over the next few years. And you can see on the chart that you know, ultimately it expects to get down to about $2 billion. This is, I'm sorry, $2 trillion. Uh, this is new territory for the Fed, and it is unclear how credit markets will react. Inflation is the single most important variable in the economic and investment landscape, and as such is always a concern for bond and equity investors. But inflation has been contained for the last few years. You can see in the top chart on this slide that inflation has remained near or under 2% for most of the last six years. An increase in inflation would reduce consumer confidence due to eroding purchasing power and rising interest rates. The bottom chart on the slide is very interesting, as it shows that we have been in a period of lower unemployment, but haven't yet experienced any wage growth. The unemployment rate, which you know, topped out at about 10% in 2010, and averages about 6.1% over the long term, is now at 4.1%, representing full employment while wage growth, which averages 4.2% over the long term, and was at 2.3% at the, at the end of the year. So full employment without wage inflation, this is basically the holy grail of economics, but that can be changing. Last Friday, the Bureau of Labor reported that wage growth expanded to 2.9%, the first significant uptick in this important figure, and the biggest increase since the middle of 2009 we are still under the important 4% level where economists become concerned about wage growth. But it wasn't a coincidence that the equity market began its recent pullback on the same day this information was released. Inflation, and specifically wage inflation, will be an important data point in 2018 and beyond. But inflationary pressures can come from more than just wages. Raw materials prices are rising. Within the last week and a half, we have had two investment managers in our office, both of whom inv invest some of your money. And they've mentioned rising input costs as concerns amongst their portfolio companies. Crude oil prices have been in an upward trend over the last two years, rising from under $30 a barrel to over $60, recently hitting a 30-month high. Copper prices have been in an upswing as well rising from just about $2 per pound in early 2016 to $3.28 at the end of last year. Commodity inflation will either compromise companies' profitability 
or it can be, will be passed on to consumers. This bears continuous monitoring. As equity investors, we focus on valuation, and the S&P 500 closed the year at a slightly elevated valuation. The price to earnings ratio, or PE, was 18.2 times 2018's earnings estimates and 16.5 times 2019's estimates. Over the last 30 or so years, the PE has averaged 15.1. However, it is important to remember that interest rates are near historic lows, with the 10-year Treasury at 2.4% at year-end. When interest rates are lower, investments tend to flow into equities as other asset classes, such as bonds, are less attractive, leading to higher forward PEs for stocks. On the other extreme, when rates are higher, PEs are typically lower than the 15.1 average. We believe that a premium multiple is justified during periods of low interest rates, but investors must remain cognizant of how much of a premium they are willing to accept and pay attention to interest rates as well as company earnings reports as unexpected news on either could cause PEs to contract quickly. Geopolitical conflicts are always a concern, and given issues with North Korea, Russia, NAFTA, the Middle East, as well as global cyber threats and terrorism, amongst others, we continue to have challenges which can manifest themselves unexpectedly at any time. But all is not negative. There are a number of economic positives for 2018. President Trump's deregulation policies have been pro-business and pro-growth. We are experiencing synchronized global growth. We have an expanding housing market. Recent tax legislation should help both businesses and consumers, and we do not see a recession in sight. So excuse me, deregulation will continue. The Trump administration set a goal of eliminating two rules for everyone created. In reality, they eliminated 67 rules and only instituted three new ones, a 22 to one ratio. These changes led to a significant increase in business confidence and in our opinion, are an important reason for the equity market's strong gains last year. We expect the culture of deregulation to remain in 2018 and beyond, continuing to create a pro-business environment. <clears throat> Bob mentioned in his remarks that we are experiencing synchronized global growth, and this slide lays it out. Each column in this chart is a year-long period showing how many of the 48 OECD countries experienced GDP growth last year. For the first time since 2007, all 48 experienced either accelerating growth, indicated in green, or slowing growth in gray. There were no countries which were contracting, which is shown in red. Global growth should help both large and small businesses achieve higher profits. The housing market is expanding. Housing starts, the number of new houses which have broken ground during a period are a leading economic indicator, meaning that when they are growing, this housing activity triggers economic growth. We can see on, on this slide that since bottoming in 2009 at under 500,000 units annually, they have been in an upward trend, now near 1.2 million units at the end of last year. Home prices, as measured by the Case Shiller Index, suggest that demand and pricing are strong as well. In a number of regions around the country, there is a shortage of housing with the inventory of unsold homes near all-time lows. We believe that this indicates continued economic strength coming from a very important industry. My colleague Ed Pulaski will now discuss the impact of recent tax legislation. Thank you, Phil. Since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was signed into law, most analysts and economists have been revising their GDP and profit forecasts higher. Although the debate surrounding its long-term impact has varied, we believe the personal tax cuts will likely lead to a pickup in consumer spending, and the reduced corporate tax rate will prove to be a long-term positive for U.S. businesses, leading to even greater corporate profitability. The tax acts could potentially lead to a transformational changes to the U.S. economy. Along with the U.S. being viewed as a more attractive place to invest in, thus it levels the global playing field. So there are positives and negatives. We'll take a crack at the positives first. 
the first positive is certainly a reduction in the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21%. Previously, this was the highest rate in the industrialized world. The income tax rate on U.S. companies is now slightly below the world average, improving the U.S. competitiveness and providing incentives for both domestic and foreign companies to make capital investments in the U.S. The next positive is a reduction in tax rates for certain pass-through businesses, certainly benefiting many small businesses, which are domestic economic drivers. Um, the, another positive is immediate expenses of capital purchases. Uh, this is such as uh, equipment and machinery. This could definitely accelerate capital formation, employment, and wages, and is certainly viewed as another economic positive. Repatriation of up to $2 trillion. Multinational corporations can now repatriate retained earnings held overseas at a reduced tax rate of 15.5. Multinationals will free up significant amounts of cash that was previously held overseas in order to avoid paying that higher U.S. tax rate. Now companies like Apple, MasterCard, Alphabet can bring that money over here and will most likely be meaningful beneficiaries of this change. Another major positive are dividend increases and wage increases. This cash will likely be used for accel accelerated share repurchases and more re robust dividend increases as companies return additional cash to shareholders. Lower tax rates also enabled several companies to already announce bonuses and wage hikes for millions of workers thus far. Also, corporate debt repayment. Companies will now choose to deleverage the balance sheet as billions of dollars have been borrowed in recent years to fund shareholder returns and acquisitions rather than repatriate and pay taxes on overseas cash to make those investments. Another major positive is the reduction in individual tax rates, which we believe will lead to an increase in consumer spending. Most taxpayers will see a reduction of about 2% in their tax rate while those in the highest tax bracket will see their marginal rate go down from 39.6% to 37%. Now on to the negatives. The cap on state and, and local tax and real estate tax deductions, that's obviously going to be impacting individual and high tax states like New York and California. Limits on these deductions hurt the economies of those particular states with high taxes on income or property this could ultimately cause declines in values for residential and commercial real estate in those states, with some predicting about a 10% decline. Another negative is the limits on municipal fund refunding bonds. This will lead to a reduction in supply. Um, this limits an important financing tool that most states and municipalities have long used to lower borrowing costs. The municipal bond market has been an important source of, of financing for infra infrastructure investment. And the new limitations on advance or funding is most likely going to raise the cost of tax exempt financing for these potential infrastructure projects. And there will be an, a modest increase to the federal deficit. This could contribute to an increase in, in inflation and interest rates. And ultimately, if it spikes, then the, the Fed may get a little more aggressive. So that remains to be seen. Now, Let's talk about the signs of a recession, which we believe are not here. One of the indicators we look to determine whether the recession is near is the shape of the yield curve. Yield curve. In this chart on top, we have the current yield curve in green, and the yield curve a year ago is in blue. As the Federal Reserve continued on its path, path of normalization of the Fed fund rate in 2017, the yield curve steadily flattened throughout the year where short-term rates uh, moved higher and long-term rates moved lower. Thus, the spread between these maturities narrowed. The chart on the bottom plots the spread between the two-year yield and the 10-year yield. While the spread has narrowed over the last several years, it did close the year around 50 basis points. When, it, when that goes negative and the yield curve inverts, and we still have a long way to go, it typically means that a recession will occur within 9 to 12 months. This, will, this year, the spread has widened and is now sitting at about 70 basis points. We'll continue to monitor this spread as the slope of the yield curve in 2018 will be de dependent upon expectations of economic growth, 
future rate hikes by the Fed, tax reform, rising deficits, and inflation. If you turn to the next slide, bull market still has a way to go. And you may have seen this uh, chart in the past, and most bull markets die a painful death and, and are followed by a recession. Uh, when these check marks, as you could see in, in the column 2000 and, and in the column 2007, all these um, conditions were occurring. As you can see currently, we have X's across the board um, where heavy inflows into the equity market funds are, are not uh, coming. If anything, bond flows over, most, over the last couple of years have been the ones we're receiving a lot of inflows. Um, there has not been a big pickup in M&A activity currently, uh, where, whereas uh, 2015 may have been the peak, certainly not now. Uh, rising real interest rates, no, we're, we're having real rates are, still remain uh, quite low. Uh, a condition of weakening upward earnings revisions, that's not happening right now. Earnings revisions have been treading upward recently. And the, la and the next I would point out is the widening credit spreads. And that's been the opposite, where credit spreads have remained tight. Um, so right now, these, the recessions typically occur under these following conditions, and none of these conditions are currently occurring thus far. So let's get into our approach to 2018 and, and beyond. We, we're, we are maintaining a diversified portfolio with prudent asset allocation, and this roadmap which you've seen before is is how we position our clients this year and beyond as you know we customize an asset allocation for each individual client based on their different needs goals and risk tolerances along with how we view the market and this roadmap defines how we view the investment landscape amongst these four baskets and and thus how we allocate your capital through a prudent asset allocation our goal is to protect and grow your assets over the long term to achieve an above inflation and above after tax return. We believe the best way to navigate and weather volatility currently in the past and going forward is by properly allocating amongst these four baskets and its respective strategies. We want to have an allocation to provide you with financial peace of mind that enables you to sleep at night. And more important, and just as important, we want to take emotion out of the equation because fear and greed often leads to bad decision making. So as you move from left to right, we would expect each of these baskets to provide you slightly better returns over the long term with more risk. Let's start with the first basket, security investments. We have cash and fixed income. Currently, we're rec rec recommending maintaining an underweight with a focus on quality and short duration. With rates so low right now, there aren't many attractive returns. And we don't believe this is a good investment at this point in time on an after-tax, after-inflation basis. Moving one basket to the right, we have our defensive strategies, hedge growth, dividend growth, multi-strategy heads investments. And right now, we are overweight these strategies. These strategies are designed to participate in the upside when the equity markets do well or protect and mitigate the downside when the equity markets are down. Thus, we believe these strategies wouldn't be down as much as the overall market. And again, we're recommending currently an overweight exposure to these defensive strategies. And then we have traditional equities, diversified equity, large cap growth, large cap value. We're mildly underweight to these traditional equity strategies as our first priority is to preserve capital and valuations are reasonable, but not cheap. The final basket is private equity, real estate, I'm sorry, private investments, uh, real estate, private equity, event-driven, real assets, and we'll use, utilize these as appropriate and remain opportunistic where it's suitable for certain clients. Here, the greater, you'll, you'll achieve a greater return, but there's greater risk involved, and it's typically less liquid while providing our clients with diversification from stocks and bonds. And before leaving this roadmap, I would just remind you that we invest your capital as well as um, our own, so thus we're investing side by side. So just moving on to our approach to 2018, as it pertains to the underweight per fixed income, 
as, as you can see here, the current yields on cash and bonds remain unattractive. Here we have the five-year U.S. Treasury and the AAA municipal bonds that are below, below the current inflation rate on an after-tax basis. Thus, buying bonds below the rate of inflation compromises buying power and does not build wealth long term. And our, moving on to our current per approach as it pertains to our overweight uh, with regard to our defensive basket, these defensive strategies are designed to mitigate uh, volatility, minimize downside capture, and capture a significant portion of market appreciation. Examples include hedge growth with a bias to gross companies, a long short strategy, and then we have our dividend growth, which is a bias to value companies. Here we're investing in high quality dividend paying stocks that have demonstrated sustainable growth in dividends over time to achieve superior returns for our clients. The goal of this strategy is to limit downside capture while maintaining significant upside. It's, it's important to note the stream of growing dividends provides a defensive nature to this investment. We would expect the dividends in this strategy to grow between seven to 10% per year. Even if volatility in the market continues to pick up and stock prices fluctuate, these companies are increasing their dividends on an annual basis and well above the rate of inflation, which gives us comfort knowing that we can get through periods of higher inflation with growing income. And the last example is multi-strategy multi has investments with a bias to its credit. Here the focus uh, or the opportunity often tend to be distressed credit. So thus all three are defensive, all three have less volatility in the traditional equity market, and all three mitigate volatility while still providing an opportunity to appreciate better than our security investments at this time. This tilt towards defensive strategies will provide, in our opinion, a good return on an after tax after, I'm sorry, after inflation after tax basis. Thus, let's move to the uh, allocation towards traditional equities. And you may have seen this chart in the past. This is a question we're often asked. This shows the S&P 500 performance during periods of rising interest rates. Um, this chart effectively shows what happens during that time. As you can see, the market performs reasonably well as interest rates rise, as evidenced by these seven periods over the last 25 years plus. Within the chart, the blue line represents the U.S. 10-year Treasury benchmark. And as you can see, during these seven periods, as the 10-year Treasury went up, the S&P 500 index annualized returns, which is shown in each of these uh, boxes, uh, performed reasonably well. We understand that History is a guide, not a guarantee, but this chart should alleviate some concerns over your traditional equity allocation during periods of rising rates. You can also take comfort in knowing that the short-term market fluctuations don't influence our long-term recommendations to clients. Our investment committee is committed to making sure that you have the proper asset allocation in place to enable you to stay the course and remain patient long-term investors as we believe you'll ultimately be rewarded. So for, so for now, I'm going to move uh, towards the summary, and I'll have Bob uh, cover that and recap uh, some of the main points we discussed. Thank you, Ed and Phil. Two, as you can see from the slide, 2017, and you can see from your portfolios, 2017 was a very strong year, and we're cautiously optimistic that 2018 will be positive as well. Um, we have... We have gone over now some real strong economic positives that we think will prevail during 2018. And at the same time, we've also discussed uh, what we call the wall of worry. Uh, I've been doing this for 40 years, and there's always been a wall of worry that investors had to, had to confront. Uh, the flavors change each year. You may recall several years ago, we were worried about Greece and Italy going bankrupt and the EU uh, falling apart. Today, the wall of worry is different. So there are positives and there are negatives, and that's why we come up with the asset allocation that we do. Corporate earnings will continue to grow, and many companies will get a boost from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, we have a number of companies in different strategies that are currently, or were prior to this year, 
having an effective tax rate of between 35 and 38 percent. Those companies will directly benefit from the reduction in the federal tax rate from 35 to, 30 to 21 percent. And that's already being reflected in some appreciating stocks and projections of better earnings this year, better cash flow. Valuations in general are not cheap, and therefore stock selection is key. Although they became a bit cheaper, certainly in the last several days, stock selection going forward is very important. We remain concerned with passive investing because that's just buying a blanket of stocks. We call that sometimes a diversification, and we believe that that has led to some of the more recent volatility. But in general, valuations are not cheap, but there are areas of opportunity. So stock selection and concentration of portfolios, we believe, is key. As Phil pointed out, volatility has a strong potential for being greater in 2018 than it was in 2017, and we've already seen that in the last several days. That should not scare us as investors for the long term. A matter of fact, there are many great investors, John Templeton, Warren Buffett, who believe that volatility is the friend of the long-term investor. We believe that's the case, even though it doesn't feel so well when you're going through that period of volatility. International investing should continue to be a driver of performance. We have recently increased over the past year and a half our international allocations, as they are typically, many of those companies and those economies are a few years behind the United States in their fiscal and, and growth initiatives. And we're starting to see international companies be rewarding both from a stock performance standpoint and from a valuation standpoint. So we have increased our international allocation. Concentrated portfolios of companies with strong fundamentals should prove successful over the long term. Uh, you've heard that from us for the 35 years we're in business, and we still believe that. We remain committed to selective opportunities in real estate and private equity. That tends to be uh, the least used basket that we have, but it's nevertheless one that we continue to look for opportunities that would give our clients significant returns, but as Ed pointed out, with some greater risk and greater illiquidity. At the end, we believe a prudent asset allocation with an overweight to our defensive strategies is the best course for most investors in this environment where there is some uncertainty even if we have a good plan, there's going to be some uncertainty. We'll endure and persevere through that uncertainty, and we believe we will reward all of our clients with decent returns over the long term, uh, and that means decent returns for us because, as Ed pointed out, we invest side by side with you. So that's sort of the summary for what happened in 2017, what we expect in 2018, and now uh, Karen will open it up to questions and answers. Great. Bob, Phil, Ed, thank you so much. We will now begin taking questions. We've gotten some great ones already. Send them in and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. I'm going to start with a question we received actually earlier today. I think we touched on some of it, but we'd like to kind of maybe dive a little bit deeper. So the question is, what are you most focused on as you keep an eye out for the potential for a recession? And um, we've got Ralph Pileski here, who's our, our president, and we'll see if he wants to take that. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, as Bob referred to in the last slide, the last 35 years, we've concentrated on companies that will grow their earnings portfolios, earnings on a consistent basis. We've assembled them into a almost like a holding company of companies, and we buy those companies at reasonable valuations. They're usually leaders in their particular industry with credible management. Uh, the, the whole focus here is earnings. And if you actually ever invested in or listened to a real estate investor and he talks about location, 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 well, we talk about earnings, earnings, earnings. And if you have the earnings, if you are very conscious of looking at what interest rates are doing and what inflation is doing, you combine those three things and have a handle on them you can produce very good results. Uh, we think the economy is in pretty good shape. It's sound and steady from a fundamental perspective. We, we're looking at four different things in that economy. We're looking at the consumer. We're looking at investment. We're looking at government spending. And we're looking at net, 
exports. In terms of the consumer, the tax cut and the bonuses are helping them, and the c consumer confidence right now is pretty good. In terms of investment, we, the new tax bill is giving companies accelerated depreciation and is a pent-up demand for investment. The, on the government side, there will be an increase in, dis, in defense spending with this administration and plenty of infrastructure projects which are being worked on right now in Congress. And then the weaker dollar has helped net exports. So when you combine those four things, you get an increase in GDP, and that creates the growth that will propel the earnings. So we're not really concerned at this point in time with uh, any of our companies from an earnings perspective. Uh, we have portfolios, whether they're managed internally or managed externally, with consistent earnings growth rates somewhere between 12 to 15 percent. And our history says that if you look at those earnings portfolios, there's probably no correlation in the short term between the earnings of a company and the price of the stock. But over longer periods of time, five years or greater, there's probably close to 100 percent correlation that the prices of the stock will follow the earnings. So that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Our next question, as it relates to inflationary pressure, what is the 10-year yield that will really increase that pressure? Is it 4%, 5%, or another number? Yeah, I'll answer. It's Ralph. I think our history has said that once the 10-year gets closer to 5%, then it becomes competition for the stock market. So I think the answer to the question is 5%. I don't think where, in, where the 10-year is today uh, at 280, it's any competition uh, for the stock market. But as that yield increases, and right now it doesn't look like it's going to get to 5% anytime soon, uh, maybe three years from now or three and a half, four years from now, we might see a 10-year 5% bond. And that usually is a trigger to have people take a second look at the equity market. But I would say it's 5%. Great. Thanks, Ralph. Next question. With the SALT changes to the tax code and with rising rates expected, do you see more problems within the residential real estate or commercial real estate market, clearly on a more local level? Do you, neither or both? And do you think we could see a real estate recession again? I'll, I'll take that, uh, it's Bob. The, um, as Ralph pointed out, as the 10-year bond goes up, it impacts uh, not only um, corporate earnings and PEs, but it will impact housing, and uh, both residential and commercial real estate. But right now, with the 10-year at 283 or 284, um, it's not affecting housing. And if it gets upwards of 5%, as Ralph pointed out, it could impact both residential and commercial real estate at that point, as it becomes more expensive for anyone to borrow. Um, with the uh, most recent tax legislation, uh, the areas that we would be concerned with for real estate uh, depreciation uh, would be in New York, California, Connecticut, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Illinois, where the elimination of the both the real estate deduction and the state and local tax deduction uh, can and will uh, impact real estate to some extent. We don't know what that extent uh, will be, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. But at that point, with those kinds of interest rates, once we get to between 4 and 5% on the 10-year, you'll start to see a little bit of a greater impact on residential and commercial real estate. Great. I think we have time for one more, and so we'll close with are you taking any specific actions with client portfolios based on the last few days? Well, I'll answer that. No, we're not. Um, again, we're long-term investors, and uh, the one message that should come through this webinar and the communications that we have with our clients is our uh, bias to fundamentals. And when we see a change in fundamentals, then we will react. The one way we have reacted over the past year and a half as market valuations became less cheap or not cheap, 
was to encourage our clients to shift more to our defensive basket and the three strategies in the defensive basket. We've accomplished that with virtually all of our clients. But a two or three day correction, the first since the first quarter of 2016, when corporate earnings are very strong, when there is a fiscal growth initiative in tax reform, when there's a middle class tax cut, and when there's synchronized global growth, um, is enough po economic positives and investment positives for us certainly not to panic because there's some greater volatility. And as I mentioned before, uh, we here at First Long Island do believe that the, uh, the vogue investing in passive indices or passive uh, investment strategies does tend to lead to greater volatility. Also, you've heard the expression algorithmic trading. Um, we've seen a lot of that recently as well. So no, uh, earnings are intact. Low interest rates remain intact. Reasonably low inflation is intact. Growth in corporate earnings is intact. And synchronized global growth is, is certainly here. And we believe that will certainly uh, help support our, our stock selections and our asset allocation. So no, we have not taken any decisive uh, moves based on the three days of uh, volatility. Great. So I want to thank everyone for joining. I want to thank our, our presenters and our team. Please note the important information that's up on the screen at the moment. Thank you all for joining us. We hope you found this session interesting and insightful. If you have any friends or colleagues who you think would benefit from joining future events like this, please let us know and we'd happy, happily include them on the invite list. For our clients on the line, we want to remind you that our investment committee is always available to discuss your individual asset allocation. Please give us a call. We can set up a time to talk, an in-person meeting, whatever works for you and your family. And finally, we hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you so much.